All right, everybody. Hello. This topic kind of fell in my lap and considering, you know, I talk about gender issues all the time and it tends to be from a woman's perspective, tends to be about women. I decided to do something a little bit different um, today. Pray for me. <laughs> um, I'm talking about this story that hit, you may have seen some form of it uh, come down the news wire. This one here, American Psychological Association links masculinity ideology to homophobia, misogyny. For the first time in its 127 year history, the APA has issued guidelines to help psychologists specifically address the issues of men and boys. Sounds great. Uh, but then if you, you go down, the thing that everybody's getting hung up on is the paragraph where they start, it's in the document in two parts. I actually went and read the original. Uh, it's in the document in two parts talking about traditional masculinity ideology. Now, masculinity ideology is something of a made up term. More on that later. But the part that's getting everybody freaking out is this part here. Um, Traditional masculinity ideology, whoops, has been shown to limit male psychological development, constrain their behavior, result in gender role strain and gender role conflict, and negatively influence mental health and physical health. Um, what defines masculinity ideology? What is masculinity ideology defined as? It says here, a particular constellation of standards that have held sway over large segments of the population, including anti-femininity, achievement, issue of the appearance of weakness and adventure, risk and violence. The report also links this ideology to homophobia, bullying and sexual harassment. If you think that that definition took a sudden left turn at Albuquerque, you are not alone. I felt that way too. Jumping from anti-femininity, which all right, you can see how you can, you can be proud to be a guy, but not anti-femininity. Achievement, nothing wrong with achievement. Um, a shul of the appearance of weakness. Um, I do that too. Plenty of women do that. Um, adventure, no problem. Risk, oh, within reason, that's not bad. And violence, whoa, what? All of a sudden, whoa. Okay, we can agree violence is bad. It's like suddenly, like, whoa. Um, and it's interesting because the first I became aware of this was actually on um, Professor Chris Ferguson's Twitter feed. Uh, I saw this a couple days ago and then it sort of hit the press today, yesterday-ish. And uh, it was in response to somebody saying, this is horrible. Basically, how do you expect men to seek treatment if you're pathologizing the state of being male? And uh, um, Professor Chris Ferguson, who's a very smart guy, who does a lot of things debunking the so-called non-existent links between video games and violence, said... Agreed. I was actually in the APA Council of Reps meeting. This was voted on and warned them this was scientifically unsound. Unfortunately, they didn't listen. And he he um, shared uh, his his letter that he sent to the council. And basically, forgive me if I get this completely wrong, but I read it. And uh, to save you some time, his issue was that it was jargony to the point of being distract uh, distracting. Um, inconsistent in its language in that it sort of flips, as he says, um, early on, it makes a hard distinction between sex and gender. And then um, it waffles. Like it seems more like an ideological thing than anything driven by science. And there, there is some jargon in the guidelines that even I hadn't heard of, like masculinity ideology. Um, that is not a commonly used term. Um, and, and, base, and he also said it was extremely repetitive. He's right. Uh, it goes on and on and on about the same things in places and I think gives um, short shrift to other things that would actually be helpful. Like, how do you deal with some of these things? Best practice guidelines are super important for stuff like that. Um, it it does sort, it is definitely uneven in terms of quality. Um, and and he says, and, and I, I agree with him for the record, um, 
there's a lot of important stuff in in this document. I'm going to get to that. I'm going to show you some of the stuff the document does say. Um, but it's distracted by this, you know, idea that traditional masculinity is inherently bad. And men who sort of view themselves as traditionally masculine, as the best practices guide says, um, are less likely to seek therapy and therefore they're alienating ver the very people who need the help the most. And this, this guidance was ignored, um, much to the detriment of it, because like I said, it says some pretty important things. Um, here's, here's the, the, the front of the guide, APA guidelines for the psychological practice with boys and men. Um, this is publicly available. I'll put a link in the description box. Um, I forgot to do the Patreon today. Crap. I'm bad at this. Let's just do this. Help support this channel. Become a monthly patron. Patreon.com slash Lena K. Uh, or PayPal description box. Yada, yada, yada. I'm going to cut this short today because uh, I want to get to the actual document. Because you see, there's a cute picture of like three generations of men, brown men, and he's smiling and playing with his kid and all that stuff. Awesome. Um, I, I, um, so you guys know, I, I initially responded before I saw the paper to uh, Professor Ferguson saying the idea of traditional masculinity as we use it today is a misnomer anyway. Uh, our idea of traditional masculinity uh, came about through Great War conscription. So World War I and World War II, this idea, stiff upper lip, don't complain, everything like that. That has only really existed since the, the World Wars. If you go back before that, um, into Victorian times, um, emotional repression or suppression was common for both sexes or genders, depending on how you want to say it, in public. But but certain things like the idea of anti-femininity, no, if you go back to the FOP era of, um, you know, French culture or English culture, anything like that. They're, they're, the idea of what's masculine and what's feminine sort of ebbs and flows throughout uh, humanity. And then, you know, if you go all the way back to the Greeks, uh, you know, you, I remember when I was in college and, and we read, uh, the, uh, oh crap. Was it the Iliad? The Odyssey, the Odyssey. Right. And, you know, guys are crying all over the place. And that's why guys are crying all over the place in Lord of the Rings because Tolkien was boring from the Greeks. But, you know, the idea that you express that because you had to show you cared. And it, I mean, the idea of what masculinity was even differed from like Athens to Sparta to Mesopotamia and, you know, all that stuff. So what is this traditional masculinity of which we speak? It tends to refer to 1950s white middle class Christian masculinity. And I, I think calling this, you know, nor the, the APA themselves, the American Psychological Association itself, normalizing a particular type of masculinity goes against their own professed goals of normalizing multiple masculinities like they're doing it and I, I liked what they were saying about um, normalizing masculinities instead of this idea that there's one way to be a man and even in the um, even in the introduction I was like oh Okay, there's some interesting stuff here. Now I warn you, this print is super small, and the 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 sort of cockeyed, the off center thing is is not me. This is the way it's displayed on the page, and I'll read it because this is probably really hard to read on your screen, especially if you're watching this on your phone. But um, you know, they they start off with the typical boys and men are diverse with respect to their race, ethnicity, culture, migration status, age, socioeconomic status, ability status, sexual orientation, gender identity, and religious affiliation. Age, blah blah blah. Intersecting, perform their masculinities. <sighs> like you see what Professor Ferguson's saying. Everybody's already asleep. Um, you know, there was a faster way to say this. Um. And, you know, re respect the time of psychologists who are like, we get what you mean. The um, 
the interesting part comes later. Although boys and men as a group tend to hold privilege and power based on gender, they also demonstrate disproportionate rates of receiving harsh discipline, uh, academic challenges, uh, mental health issues, physical health problems, public health concerns, and a wide variety of other quality of life issues. Additionally, many men do not seek help when they need it, and many report distinctive barriers to receiving gender-sensitive psychological treatment. Um, blah, 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 practice, practice, great. Um, and then they define various things. And I, I think it's kind of funny because they define, uh, you'll see here, they define cisgender but not transgender. And I think it's funny that it was sort of selective. Obviously, someone on the committee went, what does cisgender mean? Um, and, uh, you know, the definition of gender goes on a bit long. Um, they do say, although gender and sex can be seen as overlapping and fluid categories with multiple meanings, this document uses the term gender to refer primarily to the social experiences, expectations, and consequences associated with being a boy or man. Um, that's kind of interesting from a psych, uh, uh, a psych psychology perspective, I guess, because it's not psychiatry. This is more talk therapy, less the prescribing of medications. Maybe that's why they did it that way, because, you know, physiology does matter a lot. But but the the thing I actually found interesting is the things they um, defined. And some of these are kind of interesting terms. Um Gender bias, we know, but gender role strain was an interesting one for me. Um, it's basically when gender role demands have negative consequences on the individual or others. And I think it's, uh, you know, boys and men experience gender role strain when they deviate from or violate gender role norms of masculinity, try to meet or fail, um, try to meet or fail to meet norms of masculinity. That's a real, I would just say that's the same thing. Like, it's repetitive. Experience discrepancies between real and ideal self-conscious based on gender role stereotypes. That's very true. Um, personally devalue, restrict, or violate themselves. Yes. Experience personal devaluations, restrictions, or violations from others. And personally devalue, restrict, or violate others because of gender role stereotypes. And then they get in masculinity ideology, which is apparently a term that's been around since... Um, 2007 and this this is the boom clobber point the particular constellation of standards that have held sway over large segments of the population including that was the quote i um uh i read the but then they say, additionally, acknowledging the plurality of and social constructionist perspective of masculinity, the term masculinities is being used with increasing frequency. Now, this is the thing that Professor Ferguson recognized because he's more media savvy than the average professor, that obviously the other people um, who are doing these guidelines didn't get. It's that the press is only going to pick up the left wing and the right wing press which everybody's got to pick a side now, but all they were going to pick up on is this thing on traditional masculinity because it's mostly the only thing they understand. Everything else is what gobbledygook, 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 which is exactly what Professor Ferguson was arguing they shouldn't do because he was savvy and knew that this was available to the public and therefore the public was going to read it. Um, and it's too bad because... Um, the, you know, the justification for why we need professional practice guidelines for boys and men, this piqued my interest because this this is actually a big moment. And, and apparently it's been in the works for 13 years, but this is big because it's actually a mark of nearing uh gender equality getting closer because for the longest time there were no there was no need for professional practice guidelines for boys and men because psychiatry was focused on men and then more and more and more women started getting you know women are now more likely to seek help than men um and there's been a you know men are falling boys are falling behind in school all that stuff and so there's a recognition that now you know, men are not the norm. White men are not the norm. Sorry, I got to do the whole thing. White, straight, cisgender, Christian men are not the norm and everyone else is a deviation from the norm. 
men need their own specialized practice guidelines um, alongside everyone else because men are not the the you know the norm that everybody else deviates from men are their own group their own special interest group you know equal and adjacent to everybody else that's great especially since um uh, there are psychological factors uniquely affecting men um they uh and this is the other thing where they talk about traditional masculinity and i really wish they hadn't done that um because I, I do think the they, they commit the mistake. They say um, right off the top of their explanation, boys and men have historically been the focus of psychological research and practice as a normative referent for behavior rather than gendered human beings. That's what I was talking about before. Um, in the past 30 years, that this is where it starts going weird. In the past 30 years, researchers and theorists have placed greater emphasis on ecological and social factors. Ecological is a terrible source of, a terrible word. Influencing the psychology of boys and men, culminating in what has been termed the new psychology of men. For instance, socialization for conforming to traditional masculinity ideology has been shown to limit male psychological development, constrain their behavior, result in gender role strain and gender role conflict, and negatively influence mental health and physical health. Indeed, boys and men are overrepresented in a variety of psychological and social problems. For example, boys are disproportionately represented among school children with learning difficulties and behavior problems. Um, Likewise, men are overrepresented in prisons and more likely than women to commit violent crimes and are at greatest risk of being a victim of violent crime. Um, I like the fact that they said that men were actually more likely to be victims of violent crime as well as the perpetrators. But if I were editing this document, I would have just um, gone with boys have historically been a normative reference point, not referent reference point. Speak plain English, please. Um and cut all the blah, 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 citation, citation stuff, and then jump to the overrepresentation in a variety of things there. Because that's really the point. You can't, and this is what Professor Ferguson was saying unscient, was unscientific, you can't be sure that it's because of traditional masculinity. Um, the biggest problem, problems are with African-American and Latino men, or I'll say black men because I'm in Canada. We don't call them African-American here, but the biggest problems are with black and Latino men. Um, and that isn't a traditional masculinity thing. That's a, a complicated, lacking traditional rites of passage thing as much as anything else. There's no one... Um, there's a lack of people helping boys learn how to be men in a way that's comfortable and feels right for them. And so they end up picking up these cartoonish stereotype behaviors for a lack of guidance. That's not traditional masculinity. That's doping it out as you go. You know, the, the lack of male role models and everything like that. Um, it, it actually is interesting when they say and and this i mean uh, this may be true professor ferguson knows the the stuff more than i do but the comment here that it said uh despite these problems many boys and men do not receive the help they need research suggests that socialization practices that teach boys from an early age to be self-reliant strong and to minimize and manage their problems on their own yield adult men who are less willing to seek mental health treatment further complicating their ability to receive help many men report experiencing gender bias in therapy which may impact diagnosis and treatment now that part made me sit up and take notice because it goes on for instance, several studies have identified that men, despite being four times more likely than women to die of suicide worldwide, are less likely to be diagnosed with internalizing disorders such as depression, in part because internalizing disorders do not conform to traditional gender role stereotypes about men's emotionality. That's, you know, jargon again, but basically what, um, what that's saying is that a lot of therapists don't 
look deeper to see what's going on with their male patients. It's just, so how's this? I'm fine. They don't dig deeper, right? Um, they, uh, um, uh, what happens, it goes on, um, instead, because of socialized tendencies to externalize emo emotional distress, just to be a blunt instrument here, it means to yell and punch shit. Um, boys and men may be more likely to be diagnosed with externalizing disorders, conduct disorders, substance abuse disorders. Indeed, therapist gender role stereotypes ab about boys externalizing behaviors may explain why boys are disproportionately diagnosed with ADHD compared to girls. Other investigations have identified systemic gender bias towards adult men in psychotherapy and in other helping services such as domestic abuse shelters, broader societal factors such as the stigma of seeking psychological help also negatively impact men's health help seeking behaviors and subsequent delivery of psychological services. Now that's an important thing to say that men's um, depression, men's uh, anxiety conditions are instead they're looking at the externalized behaviors. So you have an anger management problem. You have a substance abuse problem. It's not that there's an underlying internalized thing that is causing the issue because again, they don't look deeper. Um, and then this is what Professor Ferguson was saying, that they were talking about gender being a social construct, and then they go on to say, in addition to specific mental health concerns and help-seeking behaviors, a combination of biological, social, and economic factors may have unique consequences for men's physical health and well-being. Um, for most leading causes of death in the United States and in every age group, boys and men have higher death rates than girls and women. So, oh, gee, there may be a biological component. You think? Um, you know, he's... He's he's right that um, and they 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 specialize sex differences and risk taking. All of a sudden they're talking about sex instead of gender. He's right. It's inconsistent. Um, and then intersectionality, all that stuff. What I and, and this is unfortunate because people are probably already triggered before we get into very interesting stuff about how. Um, the way men are, the way boys are taught to be men actually isolates them um, as they get older. Um, and, you know, th this is this is a part uh, Professor Ferguson was talking about privilege. And I want to touch on this a bit because it's actually some interesting stuff. Um, uh, but you know, the wording is going to put some people off and yeah, be warned. Okay. Psychologists understand the impact of power, privilege, and sexism on the development of boys and men and on their relationships with others. And I should say here, the document does say that these are guidelines, not standards. Meaning if a therapist wants to ignore this stuff, they can. They're suggestions. They're the pirate code. Um, but it said, Although privilege has not applied to all boys and men in equal measure, in the aggregate, males experience a greater degree of social and economic power than girls and women in a patriarchal society. Why, why do they need to say that? Anyway, however, men who benefit from their social power are also confined by system level policies and practices, as well as individual level psychological resources necessary to maintain male privilege. Thus, male privilege often comes with a cost in the form of adherence to sexist ideologies designed to maintain male power that also restrict men's ability to function adaptively. And this is why the critics of privilege theory say you shouldn't be calling it privilege. Because is it really privilege when you're forced into a very rigid social role? Um, and I, I do think there was a more clinical, less, um, the word Professor Ferguson used was um, uh, less advocacy sounding way to say that. Um, because what they were actually talking about was that thing I was talking about, about the whole benevolent sexism thing that, um, you know, men are strong and women are kind, that whole thing that there are such negative consequences for violating gendered social norms, um, that it almost immediately becomes hostile. Um, and, uh, that 
you could have got to that quicker. You could have just said that, look, there is too high a cost. Masculinity is too rigid. Um, why can't we incorporate more nurturing into masculinity? The stuff about, um, like I said, interpersonal relationships and um, fatherhood were fascinating to me. Um, they they talk about, and, and I wish they'd used this sort of language instead of saying masculinity, I wish they'd said hyper-masculinity because then here, you know, they get into, um, toward addressing this goal, psycholo psychologists recognize and challenge socialization pressures on boys, on men to be hyper-competitive and hyper-aggressive with one another they didn't standardize whether it's one word or two, to help boys and men develop healthy same-sex friendships, interactive all-male groups, self-help books, and educational videos, blah, blah, blah. Like, the point is, not, there's the whole thing about psychology is there's a point where anything's healthy. Anything in moderation is healthy. It's when it becomes too much or not enough that it's unhealthy, right? And we should be talking about hypermasculinity, not masculinity. And we should be talking about, you know, hyper competitiveness instead of competitiveness, healthy competition, having a healthy, com healthy competitive instinct, wanting to be the best um, is healthy. It's motivating. It gets you off your butt. Not being satisfied until everyone else loses or everyone else suffers. It's not enough for you to win. Everyone else must also lose. That's unhealthy competition and it, it basically means that um uh boys lose empathy they're discouraged from relating to other people because they're the competition and it leads to um it leads to a unique loneliness later in life that they're um you know only finding out more and more how how deadly it is, especially for men. And so I'm glad they referenced it. I, I wish they'd done it with less jargon. Uh, and this is when they get on, on to fatherhood and how important it is. Uh, I thought this statistic was interesting. 80% um, of fathers report being involved in their children's lives, but little more than half of fathers believe they are doing a very good job as parents. Um, and and it's you can read why but, um, you know, white middle class values that don't automatically recognize different cultural attitudes towards child rearing, that, that's nice. What about families where dad's not around at all? You know, I guess this is, this is um, uh, for, for ones where dad is around. But these are very kind of rigid. Um, but it's, it's interesting. Um, they identify components of father involvement as they call it. Why can't they just call it parenting? Um, but it's um, positive engagements, uh, warmth and responsiveness. And I'm not switching to this because there's so many parentheses here. Uh, so positive, enga positive engagement activities, warmth and responsiveness, and control. I mean, why did they call it control? Monitoring. Uh, but that, you know, warmth and responsiveness is the thing that it's very difficult when you haven't been shown warmth and they show that uh, boys are more likely to be disciplined, especially black boys and Latino boys. Um, but uh, it, uh, you know, you hear a lot about guys who when they become a dad, that's when all the old wounds involving their own dad came out and they have to face them now that they've got this little person that they're responsible for. And that's a crappy time. You're sleep deprived. You know, everything sucks because um, you've got this person who's completely dependent on you. That's a crappy time to face your own demons. And I thought it, it was interesting that um, this document determined that psychologists have to get over their own gender biases and and be more nurturing to men, ironically, the document itself is not um, nurturing to men because it it reads as attacking masculinity. And 
sorry, masculinity is a tradition. I don't really see a difference. If you're talking about conventional masculinity or archetypical masculinity, that is there's no such thing as non-traditional masculinity. I mean, the minute it's non-traditional masculinity, then it's it's considered unmasculine. You know, masculine and feminism are I feminine fe, masculine. Yeah, masculine masculine and femininity. There you go. I knew I got that word wrong. Um, but they are ideals, and most people exist on a spectrum between those sort of one hundred percent slider, one hundred percent slider. Um, most people's behaviors and socializations uh, lie actually somewhere between the two. And um, I, I, I'm surprised they couldn't say it that is just that simple. So having read the document now, I do agree with uh, Professor Ferguson's complaints. I do think this document gets in its own way and it's really hypocritical um, in the way it tries to promote information. No, hopefully this will be revised because there are a lot of good things here. Like I think it's baby steps towards recognizing that, you know, masculinity is not an absence of gender. Like it's not the, the, the normative format. Um, masculinity is not sort of the blank state, the, the, the null mark the null sign and then you know white masculinity and then oh if you're black oh if you're female whatever then all this stuff gets added on it's actually it's its own unique state of being and you know the stuff I thought was most salient is the stuff I learned from listening to you guys without judgment um maybe I should go and get my degree in social work or something like that geez um but um you know should men be encouraged to be more cooperative, to be more problem solving? Sure. You know what does that? Video games. Just saying. Um, for all the the way people jump on um, video games about violence. I mean, my husband and I are playing Overcooked right now, and that's all cooperative. You know, um, there are a lot of cooperative games. You have to work as teams. Uh, and that's, you know, the pro-social stuff in the research about gaming's influence that um, we don't normally get. But I know I kind of glossed over this um, because it's really long and I don't want to go on for too, too long. Um, but I just wanted to go through it because the headlines are very sensational and a lot of people are not going to bother reading it because it's about as dry and boring as, you know, the Lord of the Rings is just like, and then they rather, <sighs> um, but uh, watch the movies. And so I tried to make a movie version of it. Basically, the TLDR is that psychology is starting to realize that men and boys have unique challenges that they need help with and they're starting to learn how to do it but we are so behind on this because it's it still feels icky even apparently for the people who who wrote this document i mean they talk about how childhood trauma re results in like significant shame and that men can even be shamed by the process of talking about childhood abuse or childhood trauma. That childhood abuse is a huge, a huge marker for the likelihood of adult violent behavior. Um, they actually get into that. You know, all this stuff is really important. So maybe it has less to do with masculinity and more to do with childhood fucking trauma. And, and how men aren't allowed to talk about it. Um, you know... Who knows? But uh, so there's baby steps. But like I said, it seems like even the writers of this document were uncomfortable to an extent. And so they repeated themselves. They rambled. They went back and forth. You know, it, it, it reads like a first draft. And it's almost like they were trying to keep uh, certain people from feeling alienated. Um, but non-traditional ones, non-traditional men aren't the ones that need the help according to this document traditional men the ones that you know are invested in that you know getting close to that 100 percent slider on the masculinity scale they're the ones that are less likely to ask for help because asking for help is what women do 
Um, I'm, I'm not saying I believe this. I'm saying that that is the stereotype. And what we're really talking about here is teaching men and boys to individualize the same way we need to teach women and girls to individualize so that we make these sort of masculine and feminine roles work for us instead of trying to squash ourselves into this restrictive set of gender norms that may not necessarily fit us like me wearing high-heeled shoes way more often. Talk about emotional stoicism and, and unwillingness to show weakness. Try wearing women's clothing and tell me that women hide weakness. That shit is torture. Um, but, you know, I, and playing video games less because women aren't supposed to play violent video games. I know that's horribly unfeminine. Um, when you create a psychological document that enforces sexual stereotype despite yourself it just shows how much work there needs to be done and so i wish they'd listened to professor ferguson's recommendations i don't know why they didn't i think they might have been a little scared of the content which is precisely why we need these guidelines so hopefully they'll revise them and I i'm saying this as somebody who normally deals with women's issues but you know the more i do this work the more I realize that, you know, talking about women's issues, it really can't exist without talking about men's issues as well. And so I try to do it in a way so that I think it, and it, it talks about this, that we have to take down the shame of men seeming or feeling vulnerable around women, especially heterosexual men, seeming or feeling vulnerable around women. There's a lot of sexual stereotype that is enforced by the women in a man's life. And if I can do a tiny bit to counteract that, if I can make this a space where, you know, guys can can talk about the things that bother them, and you guys do, you guys do a really good job of that. But if I can sort of make this a space where that's encouraged, that's seen as a good thing, that's seen as brave and strong and, you know, all the things that men and women should be, like the fact that bravery and strength are considered masculine characteristics, come on, that's not true. The fact that sensitivity and... um and nurturing are considered feminine characteristics. No, that's not true. There's a different way, uh, the different way men perform sensitivity and nurturing. There's a different way women perform strength and bravery. But it's the same thing, you know. Bravery is bravery no matter who does it. You know, nurturing is nurturing no matter who does it. And as long as we kind of treat a guy as creepy for enjoying playing with kids well we can't complain about the emotional standoffishness that men display we're encouraging that collectively and that's why i think you know these psychological guidelines are you know important but oh man they're a hot mess okay Hopefully I've made my point. If this video seemed confused and convoluted, it's because of the source material. It is confused and convoluted. Um, I did my best, but hey, at least I'm trying to cover it. All right. Thanks for watching.